I like talking about deficit financing. I love talking about trade. So I'm going to talk to you today about what I love most to talk about. Um, and I'm going to start off pretty simple, simply and then move to somewhat more advanced material. And the justification for that is ultimately trade is pretty simple. And so, oh, I, I believe I, I learned this from Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, I read somewhere, he said that he, if there's any question about an audience not knowing the, a speaker's biases, uh, then the, the, the speaker owes it to the audience to alert the audience to his or her biases. So I'm going to alert you to my biases. This is a picture of the vanity tag I have on my, my non-American made automobile. Uh, in the state of Virginia where I live, we get, this is my license plate, as we call it, we get a maximum of seven characters in one space. I've had this license plate for almost a quarter of a century. Uh, free trade. So you know where I'm coming from. Those are my biases. I'm a free trader. Uh, I did not pop out of my mother's womb as a free trader. Um, I became a free trader uh, uh, through my study of economics combined with uh, a, a set of fairly common uh, classical liberal values that material prosperity is good, that, that everyone being treated equally is, is, is far better than having arbitrary distinctions. And so the combination of my uh, uh, classical liberal values combined with my study of economics is what, what prompted me to uh, uh, endorse free trade as a policy matter. So let's start off really simply. So on the left, sorry this is blurry, on the uh, trade for the parties who are party to it, for the people who are party to it, trade is mutually advantageous. Right? Otherwise the people who are party to it wouldn't engage in it. One of the greatest uh, uh, advantages of people in liberal society, anyone, is the ability to say no, no, I don't like that deal. No, I won't sell to you. No, I won't buy from you. Able to say, ability to say no prompts the other party to come back with a better offer. Anyone can do that. Someone poor, someone rich can do that. Jeff Bezos is richer than me. I do not, I do not have to agree to uh, use Amazon unless I find deals that he offers to be, to be good. The mutual ad advantageousness of, of trade holds whether the people live, the traders live in the same country or whether they happen to live in different countries. There's nothing about a political border that changes anything fundamental about the nature of trade. In fact, if I had to, I could stop right there and say, well, if you want a one sentence summary of the economics of trade, going back to before Adam Smith, but certainly with Adam Smith, what's the one sentence summary of the case for free trade? And it is that political borders exert no meaningful economic influence. Minor things, you have to do currency exchanges. We're not talking about national defense. That's not an economic issue. But in terms of economics, the, the, uh, uh, any political border that might separate two individuals changes nothing about the, about the nature of the transactions. Um, so as you know, America has a huge automobile industry. We still construct a lot of automobiles in America. This is a photograph of American auto, modern American auto workers building a, a Chevrolet somewhere in Michigan. So how can we, how can we Americans produce automobiles? One way is like this, and we do some of that. But let me, let's do a mental experiment. Suppose a genius inventor comes along. This guy was pretty smart, it's Thomas Edison. Suppose a genius inventor comes along and invents this machine. I have no idea what that machine really is, but invents this machine. And what this machine does is when you take wheat grown anywhere, this is a wheat field in Iowa, which is where we produce a lot of wheat in, in the US. Let's say this inventor invents this machine, and when you put wheat in it, and you press the button, and the gears function for a little while, after a few minutes or a few days, out pops that, a brand new automobile, a machine that turns wheat <coughs> into cars, corn into cars. I suspect that all of us would applaud that inventor. We say, wow, this is, what a genius. First the light bulb, then the phonograph, and now the car making machine. And how would we produce cars if this machine were available? Well, clearly we would say, well, what's the cost of growing 
uh, what's the cost of building and operating a machine? What's the cost of, of, of uh, growing wheat compared to what's the cost of producing automobiles in the old-fashioned way, like that? And whatever way is less expensive, that's the way we would choose. It would be foolish to use the more expensive way. I wish a machine like that, actually, a machine like that is invented. I'm going to show you a picture of it. You think I'm joking. That's a machine. That, that machine on the left is called a cargo ship. That cargo ship transforms some goods into other goods. In the case of the United States, it transforms a lot of wheat, which Americans export a lot of, into automobiles. This is a picture of automobiles rolling off the wharf in Baltimore, Maryland. That machine, I submit, is economically equivalent to this first imaginary machine that I mentioned to you. Trade, in other words, is a technology for turning some inputs into outputs. Those inputs can be human labor. Those inputs always, by necessity, involve uh, 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 raw materials, intermediate goods, capital goods. And production is turning those things with human labor into other outputs. And we want to use that method to get the outputs that we desire that is least costly to us. If it's less costly for a country to grow wheat, put it on a ship, send the ship abroad, and have the ship bring back things that you want to consume, that's the way you should do it. If not, produce the things at home. Another advantage of trade is that it um, uh, allows people across geopolitical borders to share ideas. One consequence of, one practical consequence of modern trade is not only the exchange of goods and services, it's the exchange of investment opportunities. There's a lot of foreign investment in every country. People in country A invest in country B, people in country B invest in country A. Without trade, that wouldn't happen because you need money to invest in a particular country. It's, no one can invest in Israel unless they get Israeli shekels, and the only way to get Israeli shekels is to sell something to Israel or to someone some, in another country who sold something to Israelis. And the advantage of this sharing of ideas, I think, is nicely captured by a contest that the magazine The New Yorker has every week uh, at, at, uh, on almost its, back, its rear page. It's called the Caption Contest. And here's how it works. Every week, a caption appears. Excuse me, a, a cartoon appears. And there's no caption. It's just a weird drawing. I almost chose this one by, by, by random. It's a fairly recent one. It's a weird drawing. By itself, it's not very valuable. It looks weird, but it doesn't provide much in the way of human satisfaction. It's strange. And then the New Yorker invites people from all over the world. You don't have to be a subscriber to the New Yorker. You don't have to live in New York. You don't have to be from New York. You can be anywhere in the world. They, they invite people anywhere to send in by email ideas for how to make this particular input into a more valuable output. They invite people to submit captions to it. And a couple of weeks later, after people have submitted the captions, I'll show you what they, what they do. Oh, so here, 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 are, the rules. here are the rules, just, just FYI. Uh, the New York, anyone age 13 or older can enter to vote, enter or vote. It's, it's wide open. It's not confined to a particular group of people, not confined to New Yorkers, not confined to subscribers, not confined to Americans. And so people submit, I'll read them to you, I know it's, it, the print is small. People then submit different captions to go along with this, I'll call it a capital good, an, a, a, an intermediate input to providing human satisfaction. The human satisfaction is fairly minor, it's entertainment, modest entertainment. So here are the three, they send them into New York, and the New Yorker editors then choose the three that they think are, are the, the funniest. So one says, they have you know, the, the clerk saying, if you're going to bury that here, you need to buy something. An, an, another says, order ready for Blackbeard. And another says, we don't take plunder. And then people vote on it, and they choose, in this case, the first one. If you're going to bury that here, you need to buy, to buy something. I submit that those, I, those captions turn that fairly mundane and valueless cartoon into something of value. It's an amusing piece of entertainment. It's a, it's a small example, of course. But it, 
it, in this case, it's the, it's the cooperation of two obvious people. The cartoonist who drew the picture and some stranger, almost certainly a stranger to the cartoonist, who submitted the caption that turned that cartoon into something valuable. The New Yorker could, it's a private magazine, the New Yorker could say, we are going to only allow subscribers to our august magazine to submit captions. Or we are only going to allow people who live on the Upper East Side of Manhattan to submit captions. We're only going to allow people who are citizens of New York City or New York State to submit captions. They're only Americans. They don't do that. It's wide open. In this case, the, the person who submitted the winning caption is from Houston, Texas. It's not uncommon to find the person submitting the winning caption being from some other country. I recall a few years ago, I looked for it, I couldn't find it. A few, uh, four or five years ago, the winning caption was submitted by someone from Tel Aviv. Anyone can submit. F free trade by opening up the globe to the free flow of commerce. Free trade encourages anyone who has an idea for how to turn a piece of land, a piece of capital equipment, a, 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 a factory. Free trade encourages anyone to contribute their ideas to make those inputs or those raw materials more valuable than otherwise. If the New Yorker restricted the people who could submit captions in the contest to only New Yorkers or to only subscribers, it might get, you know, on any one week, it might get the best possible caption in the world. But there's no reason to think so. Even if it limited to just the, 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 the population of America. America is only 4% of the global population. Why restrict the potential ideas from 96% of the rest of humanity from being free to contribute their ideas to make inputs more valuable? So I, I'm using this as, a, as, a, as a, 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 an example, again, a very simple example, again, for real capital equipment in the world, real land in the world, real factories in the world. We want those things to be used as productively, as creatively as possible. It may be that some particular plot of land in Israel, some particular factory in Israel, some particular machine in Israel, it may be that the person who has the best idea for how to use that land or piece of machine most productively happens to be an Israeli. But it may be not. It may be someone who is in Senegal, maybe someone who's in Canada, maybe someone who's in New Zealand. And when we restrict trade, we restrict the flow of ideas across borders. We restrict the number of people who are able to contribute their creativity to the global economy. Adam Smith, I already mentioned my great admiration for Adam Smith. Adam Smith uh, of course, he writes The Wealth of Nations. He writes it in 1776. I, I tell my, my American students that that's the most important event of that year, and they look at me like I'm crazy. And I, I, I say, I, I, I know you, you, there's another event that you think is more important, but I do not think that publication of Edwin Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire is a more important event than publication of, of The Wealth of Nations. And, that, and that's true. A Declaration of Independence is also important from for my view. So Smith. The core of Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations is a ringing defense of a policy of unilateral free trade. Everything he does before he gets to discussing trade explicitly and everything he does after, I think, is meant to encompass the case, meant to strengthen the case for free trade. Adam Smith had a famous example in the Wealth of Nations of a pin factory. It, the book is not a, a, a treatise on factory management. The pin factory was a metaphor for society as a whole. And I'm going to summarize this because I have a lot to cover in, 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 in too short a period of time. Um, Smith said, we know from, he doesn't say exactly when, from sometime in the past, a, a, in a pin factory somewhere in England, uh, uh, it, it took about 18 distinct steps to make a pin. And uh, uh, years ago, I'm thinking probably the mid 17th century, Years ago, ordinary pin work, he called them you know, workers of midland talent. You know, we're not talking about you know, the, the you know, superstars of pin makers, ordinary workers. Each worker could produce between 10 and 20 pins a day. Well, if you had a factory of 10 workers, that's between 100 and 200 pins 
a day. By the way, pins were a lot more important to humanity in the 18th century than they are today. This is an important product. Adam Smith says, but now, the, the, the 18th century, but now, the same kinds of workers, ordinary workers in a pin factory. Now, each worker produces on average 40, the pr productivity of the microphone is going up. <laughs> each worker produces on average 4,800 pins a day. Well, from 10 to 20 to 4,800 pins. That's a huge increase in productivity. And, and Smith wants us to understand that what's true for the factory, for a, factory, a pin factory, is true for society as a whole. So what's, what's going on in the pin factory? Smith said the division of labor, what we today call specialization. Today, mid-18th century when he wrote the book, one worker specializes in pulling wire out from the spool. Another worker specializes in cutting the wire into pin size lengths. Another worker specializes in sharpening the pin, one part of the pin, to a, a pinpoint. And Smith said, just by specialization, the output per worker goes way up. To the extent that this is true in society as a whole, if output per worker goes up, there's more output per person to consume. That's the secret, that, that is, or at least a key to economic growth. And then Smith goes on to say, so what is it about specialization that causes uh, output to go up so much? Uh, Smith gave three reasons. I'll, I'll, I'll mention these three to you in order of ascending importance, increasing importance. Smith said, when people specialize, rather than do all tasks, they say the workers save time from moving from task to task. They're not walking from one part of the factory to somewhere else. They're not driving from one part of the country to somewhere else to do, to do, another, to do a different task. They, they stay in one place, so they save time. Well, that's true, but trivial. A second reason Smith gave, and you know this from your own personal experience, is when you specialize, you simply become better at what you concentrate on doing. You, you, you learn to do it faster, you get muscle memory, you do it more reliably, you do it with fewer errors, you do it more regularly, the output tends to be more uniform, as opposed to if you do something, do some task only occasionally. Um, I, I, you could have been born with the greatest talent in the world for playing piano. If you've never practiced the piano, you won't be very good at it. You may have very middling talent at playing the piano, but if you spend a lot of time practicing the piano, you become a lot better at it. We know this from our experience. That's the second reason Smith gave. The third reason he gave is by far the most important. And that is, he, Smith said, when people specialize, when workers specialize, there's a greater chance that machines will be invented. And by machines, Smith is here talking broadly, and, and labor substitution methods of production. Machines will be invented to perform the task done by the worker. You invent a machine to do something a worker does, then society gets the output that the worker used to be producing, it's now being produced by the machine, plus the new output that the worker is doing in his or her new occupation. In 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was signed in the United States, it took about 85 Americans to feed every 100 Americans. If, we, if America still had the same agricultural technology as it had 200 and, uh, almost 250 years ago, we would still, the, the American workforce would still be about 85% agricultural. American workforce today is about 1% agriculture, and this is true throughout the industrialized world, because agricultural technology has, has grown, has expanded, has allowed each agricultural worker to produce vastly more output, so we need fewer people working in agriculture, and so therefore we can have, have uh, vastly more uh, uh, specialized physicians. We can have economics lecturers like me. We can have web designers. Back then, the only web designers were spiders. Trade is necessary for specialization. If without specialization, you can't, excuse me, without trade, you can't have specialization. I can only specialize in teaching economics if I can trade with people to give me food, to give me housing, to give me medical care, to give me entertainment. If no one was willing to trade with me, I would have to produce those, th those things myself. So trade encourages specialization. The greater the number of people with whom we trade, says Adam Smith, one of the most famous lines, at least for economists in Adam Smith's work is the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, meaning the larger the number of people who are part of the trading group, 
the greater the degree of specialization, the deeper the specialization, hence the greater the output per worker. Adam Smith got a lot right. He didn't get everything right. He got a lot right. Um, uh, one thing he didn't get, though, was gotten by this guy, David Ricardo. David Ricardo is considered to be the second great English language economist after Adam Smith. Ricardo was born in London in 1772. He died. You have a question? Just for the last uh, part. Yeah. Is there a limit for the uh, benefits of specialization? For, so I understand in, in a factory, but in a modern society, in a modern workplace, uh, a lot of people call for being more generalistic or doing more things instead of specializing. So do you think it still applies as is or should it be revised? I don't think there's a limit, but let's come back to that after I'm done with my, my lecture. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deep question. Uh, if there is a limit, I haven't seen it yet. Anyway, so Ricardo, by the way, Ricardo, although he was born in London, uh, he was bilingual when he was young. He grew up, he was born to an Orthodox Jewish family, and, the, and the, the language spoken at home in London by the Ricardos was, was Hebrew. Uh, his, uh, uh, I can't remember whether his father or mother, his, one of his parents uh, immigrate, the, the, immigrated from Portugal uh, three generations earlier, and then the other of his parents immigrated just before that, that parent was born. Uh, and, Ricard, and, and Ricardo, he, he, it's a sad story. He was disowned by his family because he fell in love with a Quaker woman. And his mother said, if you marry the Quaker woman, we're going to disown you and I'll never speak to you again. He married the Quaker woman. It was a happy marriage. Um, the mother never spoke to him again. But Ricardo had the last laugh because he wrote the second great English language book in economics. In 1817, he published on the political uh, on, on, uh, 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 political economy, on the principles of political economy and taxation. It's not a no exam. I'm not going to test you. Uh, and in chapter seven of that 1817 book, Ricardo describes for the first time clearly uh, a principle that you've heard of, and I'm going to spend some time going through because I think it's incredibly important and interesting. Um, uh, the principle of comparative advantage. So Adam Smith said that specialization increases output per worker because each worker becomes more productive at doing what he or she does. David Ricardo had a very different story. He did it in terms of countries, but it really should have been done in terms of people, which I'm going to do in just a minute. David Ricardo's story is that output per person, per consumer, can rise even if there's no improvement in the ability of workers to produce more output. And then I'm going to show you if you combine Adam Smith with David Ricardo, you get a really fascinating consequence. This is a simple example. It's a very common way in which the principle of comparative advantage is explained. I'm sure some of you, perhaps all of you, have seen this kind of explanation. It, it is built, built on a lot of assumptions all unrealistic, but every one of them made only to make the explanation uh, more easy, easily followed. We can drop, in fact, I'm going to drop one of these. We can drop all of the assumptions, and the story that I'm, that I'm about to tell you only becomes more powerful. And so one very simplifying assumption, assume a world of only two people, me and Emily. Hi, Emily. And we're going to, there's only two things that Emily and I care to consume, fish and bananas. We don't care about leisure. We don't care about anything else. That's all we care about. That's obviously unrealistic. But I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I can't draw a million products up here or a million, million people. Emily and I are stranded alone on a desert island, but at first I don't know that she's there and she doesn't know that I'm there. And what these figures show is the amounts of these, each of these goods that each of us can produce each month if we spend all of our time producing that good. So if I spend all of my time every month producing nothing but fish, I can catch 50 fish a month. So here's a pop quiz for you. How many bananas do I gather? Zero. Zero. Very good. It's important to know that. If instead I spent all my time banana erring, I would gather 50 bananas and I would catch no fish. Emily, on the other hand, if she spends all of her time fishing, she can catch 200 fish. If instead she spent all of her time banana gathering, 
she could gather 100 bananas. It doesn't matter, by the way, why Emily is better at both things than I am. Maybe she's smarter than me. Well, she is smarter than me, but could be because she's smarter than me, she's stronger than me, she's younger than me. She happens to be lucky and be, be, be on that part of the island that's better endowed with fish and bananas. Makes no difference. Because she's a woman. Because she's a woman. That's, that's fair enough. May, whatever, whatever the reason, right? She, she can produce more of each of these goods than I can. Um, another part, another so, so, but this just tells us what we can produce. This is called our, the endpoints of our production possibilities. It doesn't tell us what we actually produce. So, so uh, again, at first, I don't know Emily's on the island. She doesn't know I'm on the island. So each of us has to make a decision. How are we going to spend our time each month, which was going to be determined by how many fish do I want to eat each month compared to how many bananas do I want to eat each month? And Emily has to make the same choice. So here's what we each decide. Again, just to keep things simple, we, do, we both choose to divide our time in half. I spend half my time banana gathering, half my time fishing. Emily spends, she divides her time in half too. So we wind up with this each month. This is a very straightforward story. Each month, each of us is limited to consuming the maximum amount that we can produce. We cannot consume more than we can produce. I, I could consume more fish, but only if I spend less time gathering bananas and vice versa. Emily could consume more bananas, but only if she spends less time fishing. But if I want to consume 25 fish, I, I, can't, I can't have more than 25 bananas in the same kind of rule holds for Emily. Every month, I'm dividing my time in half. Emily's dividing her time in half, and this is what we're, this is what we're producing and what we're each consuming. Month after month after month. One day Emily's out on the desert island. She notices that I'm there too. She observes how I work and she comes up to me and she says, uh, 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 Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Emily Scarbeck. Uh, I said, Yeah, I know you. You graduated from my department many years ago. Uh, uh, I have a deal for you. So I'm, I'm going to assume Emily and I are both people of our word. We're not going to cheat each other. We're not going to try to steal from each other. I mean, her fish and bananas are the same as my fish and bananas. All simplifying assumptions. And she's making me the offer. She makes me this offer. Don, I'll give you one month from now. If we show up at this spot one month from today, I, Emily, will give you, Don, 37 fish. If you, Don, give me in exchange 50, uh, excuse me, tw I have this wrong, 25 bananas. I made a mistake on this. This should be 25 bananas. 37 fish in exchange for 25 bananas. Bob might not invite me back after this error. So I'm going to give Emily 37 fish. Emily's going to give me, uh, excuse me I'm going to give Emily 25 bananas. Emily's going to give me 37 fish. Now I have to decide if I'm going to accept this. You might think, looking at, at this table, you might think, wow, what's Emily up to? She must be up to no good. She's richer than Don. Why would she want to trade with him? Maybe she's going to, she's going to cheat him in some way. Or, or you might think, why, why would, why would uh, uh, so, so I might want to avoid trading with her. Or you might think, what does she have to gain from trading with, 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 with Don? Is she, is she stupid? And she can produce more of both things than him. Someone's going to lose from this exchange. Well, let's look. So I agree. We shake hands on it. OK, Emily, one month from now, I will be back here at this spot. I'm going to give you 25 bananas, and you're going to give me in exchange 37 fish. One more assumption. Just to make the story easy to follow, I'm going to assume that both Emily and I want to continue to consume the same number of bananas that we were consuming before we met and traded. I was consuming 25 bananas. Emily was consuming 50 bananas. So is it possible for me to, to give Emily 25 bananas and still have 25 bananas to eat for myself. Yes, I have to completely specialize at banana gathering. I can produce as many as 50 bananas. So after I make this, exchange, this, this deal, I then specialize completely in banana gathering. I'm producing 50 bananas, meaning I'm producing no fish. I'm going to give 25 of my bananas to her at the end of the month. I'll have 25 left over for me to eat. Emily, knowing that she's going to get 25 bananas from me, knows that she doesn't have to produce now 50 bananas. She can produce now only 25 bananas. What's she going to do with this time that she saves not producing bananas? She's going, to sh she's going to shift it into fishing. Here's the first difficult question. How many more fish does she produce? 50 fish. If we had more time together, I'd go into more details about that. I'll, 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 I'll say why in a moment. But she produces, we know she produces more fish. She, she in fact produces 50 more fish. So here's what we produce after we agree 
to exchange. I produce 50 bananas and no fish. Emily produces, uh, ah, I've screwed up again. That should be 25. <laughs> I don't know, I had 50. I, I, I'm sure I have a good excuse for making this mistake, but I can't remember what it is. This should be 25. Emily produces 25 bananas, knowing she's going to get 25 from me, and she produces 150 fish. She produces those extra 50 fish with the time that she no longer spends producing the 25 bananas that she no longer has to produce. We meet one month later and we exchange. I produce 25, excuse me, 50 bananas. I gave 25 to Emily. And so I have 25 bananas left for myself. Banana-wise, I am no better off or worse off than I was before we met and agreed to trade. Emily, too, banana-wise, is no better off or worse off than she was before we agreed to trade. Before, she was consuming 50 bananas. Now she's consuming 50 bananas. She produced 25 herself. She got 25 from me. But let's look at fish. Before, when I was consuming 25 bananas, the maximum number of fish that I could consume was 25. Now, I'm consuming 25 bananas and I have 37 fish. I'm better off by 12 fish. If it's the case that trade is zero sum, then Emily must have lost in this trade. But lo, she didn't. Before, she was consuming 25 bananas. And now, she's, it's going to be 50 bananas. I've got to get my banana number right. Before she was consuming 50 bananas, and now she's consuming 50 bananas. She produced 25, I gave her 25. But before we met and decided to trade, when she produced 50 bananas, the maximum number of fish she could possibly consume was 100. Now she's consuming 113 fish. She produced 150, she gave me 37, I'm leaving her with, a, with 113. Fish-wise, both of us are better off. Banana-wise, we're the same. There's no third party on this island. There's no one we can exploit. There's no slave whose labor we can, the fruits of whose labor we can extract. If we think of this as a tiny society, Don Emiliania, and it, 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 then, then, then its GDP went up by 25 fish, 12 fish more for me, 25, uh, 13 fish more for Emily. Where did that gain come from? Notice, here, with trade, each of us can consume more than we can produce. That's kind of astonishing. Each of us can consume more than each of us can produce without there being anyone from whom we're extracting that surplus. The surplus comes from the trade. I'll go into that a little bit more detail in just a moment. But I want that to sink in. And let me say, before I get to that, if you think this is a, the principle of comparative advantage, if you think it's a, uh, uh, if, you, maybe if you think, well, you know, I've constructed these numbers uh, uh, very carefully to get the result I wanted. I constructed them carefully, well, not carefully enough. With, with the, I constructed them, tried to construct them carefully in order to make the explanation easy to follow, not to generate the result. And you can prove that to yourself simply by looking around at the world you live in. Emily touched on this in her, her lecture earlier this morning. Each of us every day consumes stuff that we couldn't possibly produce ourselves. Everyone in the modern world consumes vastly more than he or she can, can produce. It seems like a mystery. The principle of comparative advantage doesn't explain it all, but it explains a good portion of it. When we go back to the original production possibilities, it looks like Emily is better at both things than I am. But she's not, not economically. Economically, she's better at fishing than I am, but I'm better at banana gathering than she is. What matters economically is not the absolute amount that you can produce. In advanced theories of trade, the absolute amounts come to have some merit, but they're, they're really minor. What matters is the cost of doing one task compared to doing another, compared to the cost of another person, thus comparative advantage. Each banana that Emily produces costs her two fish. 
the time she spends to, to gather a banana is time that if she spent it instead fishing, she would catch two fish. So for every banana she gathers, she gives up two fish. What's the cost to me of gathering a banana? One fish. I'm twice as efficient as, at, as Emily at banana gathering. I can gather bananas at half her cost. She can fish at half my cost. Each fish costs her only one half of a banana. Each fish costs me one banana. She's better at fishing. I'm better at banana gathering than she is. Trade is a mechanism. It's a process for allowing individuals with different endowments, different talents, different interests, if we were to broaden the explanation, to share in the talents and interests and different endowments of other people. Trade allows me to tap into Emily's better skills at fishing and allows her to tap into my better skills compared to her at banana gathering. I chose 37 fish for 25 bananas. I could have said 38 fish, 25 bananas, 34 fish, 24 bananas. There's a range. I'm not going to get into those details now because I prefer to spend my time doing more in, uh, interesting things than the mechanics of comparative advantage. But what matters is not the absolute amounts. What matters is the cost to each person of supplying himself or herself with one thing compared to the cost of a potential trading partner of doing the same thing. And when those costs differ, as they almost certainly do, among, certainly among, it, it's possible it wouldn't be different among two people. So when you expand it to many, many people, the, 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 the chances that everyone is going to have the same relative cost of producing everything fall quickly to zero. So she specializes in what she has a comparative advantage of producing. I specialize in what I have a comparative advantage of producing. And as a consequence, we trade and we each can consume more than we can produce. I think that is a spectacular result. And again, the, ev the evidence is all around you. you, you, you we, we all consume more than we produce. Let me, let me make one more, and I hope I didn't get the numbers wrong again. I got it wrong again there. Um, let me make one more uh, observation about comparative advantage. Let's combine for a moment Adam Smith with David Ricardo. So let's say Emily because she's specializing now more in, in fishing. And so as Adam Smith said, so let's, so let's say she's specializing, so she builds a, a net, so that's a machine. She didn't have a net she, before she was catching fish by hand. So now she specializes and, 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 and in the process of specializing, she realizes it'd be great to have a net or maybe she just becomes better at fishing. Some, some Adam Smith-like process, some Adam Smith-like consequence that allows her to become an even better fisherwoman than, than she was before. So now, after that happens, she can produce, were, to she, were she to spend all of her time fishing, 300 fish each month, not just 200 fish each month. So here's a simple question. Is she better off? Yes, she's clearly better off. She's made herself a better fisherwoman. There are two interesting follow-on consequences. By making herself a better fisherwoman, by, by moving from 200 to 300 maximum possible fish each month. Economically, she's made herself a worse banana gatherer. Her ability to gather bananas hasn't changed. Her physical ability hasn't changed to gather. But economically, she is a worse banana gatherer than she was before. Here's something even more remarkable. By her making herself a better fisherwoman, she's made me, relative to her, compared to her, a better banana -er 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 a better banana gatherer. By her becoming a better fisherman, she makes me a better banana gatherer, economically. You can see that because before, because each banana still cost me one fish to produce, before I could gather a banana at one half of Emily's cost of gathering a banana. Now I can gather a banana at one third of her cost. So she's by becoming a better fisherman, she's lowered my comparative cost compared to her, comparative cost of producing bananas. I know I'm not going to go to it here because I'm going to get into other stuff, but if you imagine a world in which suddenly you have a bunch of Dons and a bunch of Emilys, a bunch of banana producers and a bunch of fisher, fisher people who come on, on the scene, uh, uh, then in competing with each other, 
they can lower the prices at which they, the, the competition causes them to lower the prices at which they sell to, to, uh, 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 to buyers. Before this happened, if I demanded from Emily uh, two and a half uh, fish for each of my bananas, she would have said no. She would have said, well, I can produce a banana for two fish, Don. I'm not going to give you two and a half fish for banana. Now it's at least possible for me to, if I'm a hard enough bargainer, to extract two and a half fish from her because she knows if she rejects my bargain to get a banana, it's going to cost her three fish to produce that banana. And if you imagine me becoming a better banana gatherer, the Adam Smith thing working on me, our productivity compared to each other goes up. This is, I think, an essential feature. It's not the only thing that happens, but it's an essential feature of the way the world works. And again, I just challenge you to look around and ask how much of what you consume on a daily basis could you possibly begin to produce? And the answer is virtually nothing. And that's true for every one of us in modern society. We all, every day, without thinking about it, because it's so common and so smooth, we consume far more than we can produce. And it's not being extracted from anyone. It's coming from both the, the uh, 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 forces identified by Adam Smith and the, the principle of comparative advantage identified by David Ricardo. Um, this is just one graph. You, but you can Google it. This is uh, uh, one of the advantages of lecturing in the modern world. It's one of the disadvantages, too. A disadvantage, you can't say anything it, 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 that, that you might get. You can't say anything wrong if you get caught. Um, uh, so it keeps you honest. Uh, but you can also say, you know, a, a bunch of more of this kind of Just Google, uh, you know, trade and, and economic growth, trade and per capita uh, income, and you find an, all, an overwhelming evidence that. Uh, freedom of trade is positively correlated with uh, uh, both economic growth, rates of economic growth, and with per capita income. There was a famous paper written in 1995 by Jeff Sachs and uh, uh, Andrew, I think his first name is Andrew Warner, uh, looking at the causality there, and they found convincingly that the causality runs, it was published in the American Economic Review, the causality runs from openness, trade openness, to high income growth and high per capita income. Uh, and it's not a spurious correlation at all. So economically, trade is, is uh, 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 remarkably good, at least in terms of increasing ordinary people's access to material goods and services. I think the greatest advantage of trade, however, or one of the great advantages of trade, is that it is an engine of peace. It doesn't guarantee peace. But there's an extensive literature on the relationship between freedom to trade and the chances of uh, a hot war breaking out. Again, it's not a guarantee, but the correlation is pretty high. The more you trade, the more nations are integrated by trade, the less likely they are to get into a shooting war with each other. The reasons for this should be obvious. First of all, I mean, the, the most obvious one is it's just bad business to shoot your, shoot your customers. It's bad business to shoot your suppliers. You, you sell less, you get less. That's true. But it's also the case that to trade, you know, we, we talk about arm's length trade, and there's a certain, there's a certain uh, value to that term. But trade always involves, in the real world, some empathy with your trading partner. You have to get to know them. You visit the different countries. You know what they like, what they don't like. You learn to speak the languages. That's easy for me, an American, to say. Uh, 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 you, you, you learn the, 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 the people on the other side of the political border are not just utter strangers. They become part, of, in a way, part of your society. You become dependent upon them, they become dependent upon you. This mutual dependence um, reduces the risk of, of war. There's a famous, probably the most famous study done recently on this was done by Solomon Polachek, who, who, just coincidentally enough, was an undergraduate professor of Russ Roberts at the University of North Carolina back in the early 1970s. Now he's at University, State University of New York at Binghamton. And Carlos Siegley at Rutgers. Um, and I'm not going to 
I, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. Uh, I'm just going to figure out a way to, to extract it. But I'll read the, the, the important part, the conclusion for the abstract from this paper. So the, it was a 94-page long, deeply empirical uh, 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 paper. Further, the impact of trade is strengthened when bilateral import demand less, that's, that's kind of boring. Because democratic dyads, so here bilateral uh, trade, because democratic dyads trade more than non-democratic dyads, democracies cooperate with each other relatively more, thereby explaining the democratic peace that democracies rarely fight each other. This paper then goes on to examine further extensions of the trade conflict model regarding specific commodity trade, foreign direct investment, uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, uh, so they, w w what the authors of this paper did was look at individual uh, bilateral trade relationships, US, Canada, US, Israel, uh, uh, Germany, Sweden, uh, uh, looked at the extent of trade in various different ways, and they discovered a very powerful correlation. Uh, I, th I think the numbers are, um, well, yeah, here. A doubling of trade leads, this is the part I really want to read to you. A doubling of trade leads to a 20% diminution of belligerence. This result is robust under various specifications and is upheld when adjusting for causality, blah, 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 blah. That's pretty significant. Peace is a good thing. Yeah, it doesn't guarantee it. But it's a good thing. The great exception to an argument for free trade, of course, is the national defense exception. And I'm not going to argue against the national defense exception. Adam Smith had it. I think any sensible person would include it. But note, it is, as Adam Smith noted, it is an exception not that, the, that, that tells us not that, that restricting trade in order to better ensure military defense makes the country materially richer. It doesn't. It's a cost. It's just a cost worth bearing. But you've got to be aware of the national defense exception. Uh, once it is, exists, and, and all reasonable people think it should, you've got to be aware of it because when it exists, it's too tempting for nearly every industry to say, oh, I'm important to national, I'm important to national defense. So there's no way to avoid that. But it's just, just, just a point to keep in mind that just because an industry claims to be vital to the national defense, just because representatives uh, of that industry claim that, that the industry in their district is vital to national defense doesn't necessarily mean that it is. But also, also relative now to this paper that I just mentioned to you by, by uh, uh, Polachek and Sigley, uh, to the extent that protectionism then increases the prospects of a hot war, if you go too far with the national defense exception, Ironically, you might need national defense more. The ultimate national defense is to eliminate the need for war. Now, we're never going to actually eliminate it. But an important tool of national defense is to diminish the prospects of war. And trade is a tool for diminishing the prospects of war. Um, there are lots of uh, arguments against trade. I'm going to list some that I suspect you have, but I'm willing, I, I'll be happy to take your objections to them. I'm going to give you my policy conclusion, uh, but before I do that, let me just mention, I mentioned Russ Roberts earlier, he was here on, on Sunday. Uh, this is a picture of the third edition of his book, which was first published in 1995. It's a wonderful little book. It's only about 100 pages long. It's a work of fiction. It's a ghost story, actually. It's called The Choice. Uh, uh, it's, it's a story where the ghost of David Ricardo comes down to visit a, a, a modern businessman. Uh, and they, they have a dialogue about the virtues of free trade and protectionism, free trade versus protectionism. And uh, when I read the first edition, this is how I got to know Russ, I read the first edition of The Choice. And uh, I'm not a fast reader, but I got, it was 104 pages. And I, I got to the end, and I, I, I literally was crying. I had tears in my eyes. This is back in 1994, 95, uh, and I, I remember going to the office the next day and writing a letter to him, printing it out, put, putting it in something called an envelope, and then putting it in something called the mail. And I, I, I mailed it to him, and it took several days to get from Washington, for, for, at the time I was in South Carolina, from South Carolina to, to St. Louis, Missouri. Then a, several, a, a week or so after that, I got another envelope back from him. That was how primitive life was back then. But that's how I got to know and, and befriend Russ Roberts because of this book. I, 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 there are lots of really good pieces of literature 
on trade. But if I had to recommend one book on trade, if you only can read one book on trade, read The Choice by Russ Roberts. It's enjoyable, it's entertaining, it's moving, and it, I think it's an incredibly effective, it makes an incredibly effective economic and ethical case for free trade. So my policy position is if we exclude national defense, we all agree that there's a national defense exception. So we have to rely upon military authorities. We have to, we have to hope that people are acting, acting in good faith and putting politics and special interest group um, uh, 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 motives aside and saying, well, we will restrict trade in X, Y, and Z because doing so is necessary to strengthen our military. Putting that exception aside, I join Adam Smith in being, and, and lots of other economists, by the way, in, in being a, an advocate of a policy of unilateral free trade. So being an American, uh, if, the, if it were up to me, the U.S. government would in no way, re, other, again, other than for national defense reasons, would no way restrict my or other Americans' abilities to buy anything, regardless of where the sellers happen to be. I'd be free to buy from from California, just as I'm uh, from, from China, just as I'm free to buy from California, free to buy from Israel, just as I'm free to buy from Iowa. I'd be free to invest anywhere. Other people would be free to invest in, in the U.S. Now I know, because I spend my life, much of my life, uh, debating trade, talking about trade, writing about trade, um, that there are lots of objections to free trade. I, I give this lecture, a similar lecture, oh, you're naive. Okay, I'm naive. What, what, what am I naive of? Hey, you're free to accuse me of being naive. But, but let, let me tell you what the biggest, and you probably know it, the biggest argument against free trade, by far, the, the one that most people uh, uh, believe, just one sec, is, well, it, what's that? It is, is, is it, free trade leads to unemployment. Well, if we allow imports in, then that's going to cause some unemployment. And so the way to protect the, the, the level of employment in our country is to keep imports out. It's like looking at one half of the story. Uh, it's true, if you allow your country to import more steel, then there'll be fewer steel-making jobs in your country. That's true. Some workers are going to lose their jobs. But foreigners do not sell you things because they love you. They're not gifting anything to you. By the way, it'd be great for you if they did. But they're not. They're selling you stuff, and you're paying them in shekels. They're selling you stuff because they want to buy stuff from you. Or they want to buy stuff from people in another country who want to buy stuff from you. So when, whenever a country imports, that country's exports will rise. Or, it's usually both, or investment in that country will go up. In the United States, I, I, I don't know about Israel's trade balance situation, uh, but in the US, uh, Donald Trump, who was uh, astonishingly ignorant about, and still is, he hasn't changed, astonishingly ignorant about trade. Um, Donald Trump, during the 2016 campaign, pointed to the US trade deficit, uh, which, by the way, we've been running in the US since 1977 since long before you were born, and saying that this is a sign that we're losing at trade. A trade deficit arises, to simplify it a little bit, trade deficit arises when a country in some period imports more, measured in money, than it exports. And from a businessman's standpoint, that does look bad. Well, you're, you're buying more than you're selling. That's bad. But from a, from a trade standpoint, it's not bad at all. In fact, it's good. Under almost all circumstances, it's good. When a country runs when a modern country runs a trade deficit. Uh, what that means is that foreigners are especially interested in investing in your country. They want to build factories in your country. They want to buy factories in your country to, to maybe run them better. Why should we be upset if global investors are so, so love our country that they want to invest more here? I don't see why we should. And so those the, the, those shekels or dollars or whatever the currency is come back into the country. Investment rises in the country. More investment per worker generally means higher output per worker, which raises wages per worker. 
whether it's in, the money comes back as investment funds into the country or comes back as direct demand for that country's exports, trade does not reduce overall employment. You cannot find any evidence, any solid evidence, that trade reduces the overall level of employment in any country. What trade does is shift employment from industries in which that country has a comparative disadvantage into industries in which that country has a comparative advantage. And we want that because when that happens, the productivity of workers in those industries goes up. And when productivity of workers goes up, wages goes up. Wages go up. And when wages go up, the standard of living goes up. I have more to say, but I want to take this, this gentleman's question before I go on. Yeah. Uh, I, I know this uh, uh, Milton Friedman uh, opinion, it's, it's pretty much like that. And the biggest uh, problem that uh, were, were said against it is what about those people that you hurt while you uh, destroying an industry that might not be replaced as fast as it could. Mm -hmm. uh, you can destroy a, a lot of people's life and they maybe won't pass as fast or, or even at all to another market. It is certainly the case that it's very rare that the people who's, who lose jobs because of imports are the same people who shift into the export uh, uh, markets. That, that's true. But there's nothing unique about international trade that destroys job, jobs. Any economic change destroys jobs. Um, my, one of my favorite examples, I'm sure there's a similar example in Israel, but about 25 years ago, the, the Atkins diet fad swept through America. This is, you know what the Atkins diet is? This is a high, high protein, low carb diet. And uh, there were a bunch of donut shops and bakeries that shut down then. And one of the big donut uh, franchises in the U.S., Krispy Kreme, said they blamed their, their, their loss of, of, of business, quite correctly so, I believe, on the Atkins diet. So people working in donut shops, bakers baking donuts, uh, people working in breweries lost jobs because beer is a high-carb high beverage. Any economic change causes some people to lose jobs and other people to gain jobs. There's nothing unique about foreign trade that does that. The percentage of jobs lost to, that can be traced to international, job losses that can be traced to international trade, is obviously larger the smaller the country is. In the United States, it's about 1%. About 1% of job losses every month in the U.S. Are, are directly caused by international trade. I don't know what it is in Israel, I actually tried to find it and I couldn't, I couldn't get good enough data on it. I'm sure it's out there, I just was uh, uh, too unskilled to, to access it. I'm sure it's larger, but I would bet it's nowhere close to a majority of the job losses. I would bet the typical, if you take any month in Israel, you, you look at the people who lose jobs because, uh, not, not because they were you know, dishonest employees, not because they retired, not because they went back to school, uh, but because you know, their, their company shut down, they got laid off. Uh, the, the vast majority of those job losses, I'd be willing to bet, had nothing to do with international trade. It had everything to do with just ordinary economic changes, a automation, changes in consumer tastes and preferences. Can you please uh, explain more about the argument that you made of the, uh, the positive uh, the, of uh, deficit in trade? Yes. So, um, uh, in a world without Imagine for a moment a world without investment. You can't invest. All you can do is, is spend. Uh, if Israelis import, I'm just making up this number, a, a million dollars worth of goods from America. So you, 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 you bought a million dollars worth of American imports. Right? And you pay for them in shekels. And, and then the only thing, if without investing, the only thing Americans can do, and, and for simplicity, assume only two countries, Israel and America. Trust me, it doesn't matter. We could have 300 countries. It's, it works out. In a world of only two countries, what are Americans going to do with those shekels? What, what can you possibly do with a shekel in America? You have to spend it. And where do you spend shekels? Israel. So that, all those million shekels come back to Israel as demand for Israeli exports. That makes sense? Yes. It, it really so it winds up in this case, Israelis export a million, do, a million shekels worth of things to America. Americans 
export a million shekels worth of things to Israel. If we allow investment, then let's say if, if Israelis still, you, you, you buy a million, a million shekels worth of things from America, Americans find themselves with their, their one million shekels of revenue ha having sold stuff to Americans. They could spend it all buying Israeli exports, but responsible people often like not to consume everything they possibly can. They like to invest. So let's say I'm one of these Americans. And I, let's, let's say I'm, I am the American. Uh, and I, I, have, I have a million shekels. And I'm, I've, I just, I've just sold you something. I've sold you a million dollars worth of economics lectures. You've overpaid, but that's what I sold you. And I have these million shekels. I could. I, could, oh yeah, I love Israeli wine. It was really good yesterday. I'm going to buy a million shekels worth of Israeli wine. Right? So that would, that would be the first example, just exports equal imports. But suppose instead, I think, you know, I'm really impressed with what I saw in Israel. This really dynamic economy. Uh, it's a rule of law. Uh, investments are pretty secure. I want to turn my million shekels into, in, or some portion of them, into something more. I think I'll invest in Israel. So I, I think I'll go into business with an, with, with an Israeli and start a, start a, open a restaurant, start a factory, buy shares in, 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 in an Israeli firm. Those million, let's say I do all million, those million shekels come back to Israel, but they come back not as demand for Israeli exports. They come back as investment demand in Israel. In that example, this simple example, Israel runs a one million shekel trade deficit with the world. That, that makes sense? I cannot understand the very strong assumption that the money in the deficit coming back is an investment. I mean, if now the United States is, this, is in a de, uh, deposit with China, for example, China can buy uh, with those dollars uh, oil from Riyadh. So, th th which is why I said assume only two countries, but, but let's not just assume two countries. Let's assume the 294 countries that we have. Who in the world is going to, the only reason anyone in the world is going to accept shekels is if either they or someone they know wants to use, wants to either spend or invest shekels. And where are those shekels spent or invested? And that is in Israel. So let's say that I get the million shekels and then I buy something from China or invest in China. Then we have to ask, why would those Chinese people accept shekels? You can't spend shekels in Beijing or Shanghai. It must be that the person in China accepted the shekels because they either want to buy something from Israel or to invest in Israel. We could add a fourth country. We could add 10 more countries. If there's no one in the world who wants to either acquire exports from Israel or to invest in Israel, and I find myself with a million shekels, I'm out of luck. I, I can't, if, if I don't want if, if to, if I'm like one of those people, I'm out of luck. I just have a bunch of paper. I, I don't want to spend it or invest in Israel. No one else in the world wants to. But if I do manage to use those shekels to buy something from, from Canada or from New Zealand, it must be the case. Or to invest it in those countries, it must be the case that the people who sold me those things from those countries, or who sold me the investment products from those countries, it must be that they want to invest in Israel or to buy from Israel. It's got to be that way. The, the, for, the simple way to say this is, people accept currency for the same reason you accept currency. I tell my students, people, foreigners accept American dollars for exactly the same reason you accept American dollars, because you know you can spend or invest them in America. People around the world accept shekels for the same reason you do. They know they can spend them or invest them in Israel. And if that weren't true, then, we, then, then there wouldn't be any, any trade deficit because no one would be willing to accept the currency in exchange. Is there a hand up over here? So this is the, the we're talking about here, wow. I, you, I, I, I was expecting like a whole bunch of, well, what about, what about, okay, good. If I can ask another question. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, well, uh, there's the example of the Chinese coming into the WTO in mm -hmm. the 90s, 
And then, uh, let's say... 2001, December 2001. Excuse me? So, uh, and then they're like starting to create a non-free trading. As the United States is reluctant uh, to the trade uh, rules that she created. So what do you think the United States should do with those kind of uh, player who plays none of the rules? So I mean, China is, China is getting to be a pretty bad actor now, particularly since President Xi is becoming more and more, more and more powerful. Um, if you look at the uh, record of the Chinese, the, the last study I saw was done in 2021, and I think it went through 2019. So it's kind of up to date, but, but ended just before COVID. If you look at China's record of abiding by WTO rules and rulings, it's actually pretty good, at least, at least up until then. Uh, it's not perfect. No country is perfect. The United States, certainly not perfect. The United States often basically thumbs its nose at, at the W. Not often, but sometimes thumbs its nose at the WTO. So we're not, we're, we're not going to abide by it. There's a value to countries that's remaining in the W. If you, if you do it too often, you get booted out. You, you, get, you get excluded. There's a value to countries of remaining in the WTO because it does give exporters in those countries, this is how the countries perceive it, it gives exporters in those countries much greater access to the world's biggest economies. I think the great advantage to being a member of the WTO is that it gives consumers in those countries access to producers uh, 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 around the world. So the, the, answer to this, the precise answer to the WTO question is it almost will solve itself. If China, if China becomes too belligerent, belligerent is the right word, too stubborn or too uh, uh, obstinate in abiding by the rules that it agreed to abide by, to, to abide by, by being a member of the WTO, then it just gets excluded from the WTO. I'm not sure exactly what the, 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 the formal process is for exclusion, but there is one. It gets excluded. And it, doesn't, it probably doesn't want to get excluded, because if it gets excluded, it loses huge uh, export earnings. Um, China, I, I confess, though, China is a... Uh, um, China presents a problem. You know, there's all autocratic countries of that sort do, a problem beyond national defense. Uh, I mean, for example, you know, the, 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 you know, the Chinese mistreat a lot of their own people. I mean, they, you know, the, the, for religious reasons, a lot of people in China are, are horribly persecuted. So what moral responsibility do non-Chinese people have to those people within China who are being victimized by their own government? Is it possible that restricting trade with the Chinese will, will uh, soften the heart of Beijing and stop mistreat or reduce the mistreatment of the people that they're mistreating? It's possible. And if it's possible, then I, I think a, a, a particular case can be made that trade restrictions with the Chinese uh, might be justified on that, on that ground. Um, I'm skeptical that such trade restrictions would have that effect, but I, I'm aware of the possibility. Uh, and I, and I, I admit that if the possibility were, were, were high enough, then I'd be willing to break even my pretty hardcore um, uh, commitment to a policy of, of unilateral free trade. Um, in the, you, 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 you may or may not have heard of this, the, the big complaint, the, the biggest complaint that Americans have about trading with China isn't about the Chinese mistreatment of, of, of religious minorities. It's about alleged Chinese intellectual property theft in America. And that sounds really bad, right? So you're stealing intellectual property. So, and and uh, there is some of that that goes on. Um, but when you look at the, the, what actually goes on, and I've done this in a paper that I wrote with a former colleague of mine, Dan Griswold, um, the most of what's called intellectual property theft in China is in fact not theft unless you simply believe taxation is theft. It's not theft. It's an in-kind tax. The Chinese basically tell, the Chinese authorities tell a foreign company, say, well, you, we'll let you do business in China. We'll let you sell 
to our huge market if you turn over to us this, that, and the other part of your intellectual property. Now, if you don't want to turn over that part of your intellectual property to us, you don't get access to our market. The way I look at this is that that requirement is a tax that the Chinese government is imposing on foreign entities to get, as a, as a, as a, and what that tax does is discourage foreign entities from doing business in China. Not every company that has been asked by the Chinese government to turn over intellectual property has done so, not by a long shot. Many of them do. So in their view, the, the, they, they believe that access to the Chinese market is worth more to them than the value of the intellectual property that they sacrifice. I wouldn't call that theft, again, unless you call taxation theft. I just think it's a, it's a form of taxation. And I think that the main victims of that taxation are the Chinese people. Because, but, because by having this sort of in-kind taxation regime in place, the Chinese discourage uh, uh, foreign sellers from entering the Chinese market, thereby denying the Chinese people access to the goods and services that those companies that refuse to turn over their intellectual property would otherwise sell to the Chinese people. Yeah. Is it a disclosed uh, taxation or? Say again? Is, it, is this the taxation uh, disclosed? I mean, do they tell you it, we want to get the intellectual rights? Yeah, they, well, they tell the company. They, 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 I, I, I don't, know the, I don't know the details. I, I make a company up. Let, let's say Coca-Cola wants to sell in China. Uh, and let's say Coca-Cola has a, a, a patent, an intellectual property on a particular way to, to uh, uh, preserve carbonated beverages. You know, just making this example up. But, uh, then Coca-Cola goes to China and says, I, I want to sell in China. And Beijing says, whoa, uh, you can't. You need our permission. OK, wh wh what do I have to do to get your permission? Well. I, I, we would like access to your, 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 your patent. Get, to, we want that knowledge, and we want the ability to use it. And it's up to Coca-Cola to say yes or no. If it says yes, it turns it over, and then it gains access to the Chinese market. If it says no, the Chinese government does not get the intellectual property, but Coca-Cola is not allowed access to the Chinese market. Again, that's just an example. I have no idea if Coca-Cola got involved. It, 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 just an example, but that, that, that is the kind of thing that happens pretty regularly. Yeah. I want to ask again about what I said uh, in a different perspective in my um, pr prior uh, question. Uh, is that you, you told me that uh, every day people lose their jobs, but what about a, a case that uh, a whole market, a whole sector that did it, this particular thing for 40 years and then loses his jobs. It's not like I'm working in marketing and I lose my job and I work in another uh, company in marketing. It's a whole sector that can be replaced from... It's not like I can work in agriculture for 40 years and then when I lose, I lose my job I can get a new job in another agriculture company because there is no agriculture. So I don't have anything to do. So you, like, for example, when the computer hit the scene in the 1980s, whole, whole types of jobs were suddenly eliminated. Uh, uh, sec I'm not sure what you call them, secretaries and secretarial pools. They were a big thing until the early 1980s. All gone. But that had nothing to do with international trade. Yeah, I'm saying that for the long run, uh, for sure it's going to be a good thing, but what can you do to diminish the, the short-run uh, uh, problem? Or so one thing, thing I would not do is restrict trade. So, one th so th there are, th people have thought about this, obviously. And so, so, I, I, I like a statement that the economist Thomas Sowell is famous for saying. He says, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. There are no solutions, there are trade-offs. So one possible approach is to have what we call in the US trade adjustment assistance. So if you can if you can show that you lost your job because of increased import competition, 
and you get access to a, 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 a series of, of, of government uh, assistance, job retraining, uh, special uh, 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 unemployment benefits. That's, that's one thing. I prefer that to restricting trade. Unfortunately, when you look at the record of trade adjustment assistance in the U.S., uh, as the great trade economist Doug Irwin has done in several papers, it doesn't have a very good track record. We, we can't find much evidence that, the, that, the, that these programs do much to help the workers who are displaced by, by imports, which means practically the workers displaced by imports, uh, despite the fact that they have access to these programs and other workers displaced for other reasons don't, the workers displaced by imports don't seem to have any better or worse uh, post-job loss outcomes than do workers who lose their jobs just because you know, consumers don't like to eat, eat carb carbohydrates anymore. Um, that, so, but but may maybe the, the answer to that is to you know, re-engineer the programs to make, to make them work better. Uh, but on that, you have to be careful. Because once you start, once you start, once you uh, attach to a particular kind of job, a particular privilege, there's, there's, there's certain jobs that are, the market knows, people know, these are more, more likely to be subject to import competition than others. If you're a barber, you're not going to be subject to import competition. If you're, if you're a steel worker, you, you might be subject to, steel comp to, to import competition. If you give that job a special privilege, so if you lose your job as a steel worker, you're going to have access to all these, all these government-granted privileges. If you're a barber, you don't. What that does is uh, uh, increase the attractiveness of becoming a steel worker relative to becoming a worker in some other industry that's not as subject to import competition. And so, you, ironically, you wind up with more workers in those industries that are subject to losing their jobs to imports compared to the number of workers who would be in those jobs if those programs didn't exist. So, yeah. That's why there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. Yeah. Uh, it's one question, but it's not true. Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts about uh, the fintech possibilities of the unbanked people here now that opened up with uh, digital currencies and everything like that on uh, a future trade? I know nothing about digital currencies or fintech. So let's. Uh, yeah. I'll ask so, you differently. I'll, I'll yeah. show you that you do. The people that are uh, okay. were not about the uh, big commerce game. Mm -hmm. uh, now, these days, the unbanked have uh, digital wallets and the ability to walk inside the game, even though the bank, the bank, the traditional bank, doesn't allow them. How do you think? Uh, I'm still not sure I understand it, but, but uh, it, to the extent that these sorts of technological changes uh, better enable people to integrate themselves with, uh, with people in other countries, I think it's generally a good thing. I, I, I think it's a good thing. I, I, like, I like the idea of a of a, a fully integrated global economy. We'll never fully get there. So unified the, currency is something you, you might look at the, in, in a positive, uh, in a positive uh, look? What, what kind of currency? Uh, a worldwide uh, unified currency of some sort. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're not close to being able to have that yet. I mean, the, 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 uh, there's a you know, long, extensive That's literature. Totally or, yeah, yeah, it, 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 it is certainly economically possible for the global economy to become so integrated that it, it, the, the, the world, the globe, becomes what we call an optimal currency area. That's certainly possible. We are nowhere close to that at this point. But I, I'm not, I, I certainly don't object. I would love to see the world move toward that. Yeah. Which, by the way, wouldn't necessarily mean the end of, no. of, 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 of sovereign nations. Um, another question, how, how can you make sure, uh, for example, if you have a steel industry and another country has a steel industry and you're the only ones that have steel industry yeah, and they out-produce uh, it, they're cheaper and you have free trade, they might uh, uh, 
and, and they can sell steel at your country, so your industry will shut down eventually, and then it would have excess power to raise prices as, as it will. How, how can you make sure that these sort of things don't happen? You can't. Uh, but that same problem exists internal to a country as well. Um, so it's easy to say, what if you, you're the only steel producer and what if you know, the, the other country's the only steel producer? Uh, even if that's the case, there still may be several steel producers in that other country and they're competing against each other. And so in order to have a true monopoly power in steel production, it wouldn't, it, you, you need more than just all steel coming from one country. You need all steel coming from one company. Or, or all steel coming from a country that cartelizes its, its, its steel market. That's not absurd. It, 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 it's unlikely. No, it's not absurd. The vast majority of products, are, I, I think we, we're, we know we're close, we know we're close to that. Uh, I've re, I looked at this not long ago. And there are something like 70 different countries that produce steel, seven zero different countries, some a lot more efficiently than others. And within those 17, I'm sorry, not 70, uh, I'm thinking of different, uh, 36, 37. And within, within those, taking all those 37 countries that produce any amount of steel at all, the number of different steel producers is, is in the hundreds. And so the, the steel example doesn't work. You can certainly imagine a commodity or an output where you only have one company in one country and another company in another country, and uh, uh, the the you, you, you get that you get that monopoly problem. History is history is not filled, however, with examples of this being a problem. I don't know, like chips or things like that. that now get a lot of news, but not one by one, but a very small number of companies that, that produce high high. Yeah, uh, mostly in Taiwan. A lot of them in Taiwan. In, 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 in Taiwan. Um, there, there, there are, there are, are trade-offs. No one has a better incentive, by the way, to ensure the optimal mix of low cost versus access to a, 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 a variety of different suppliers. There's, there's value to both. And so uh, p uh, producers who use chips, they're not naive. They understand the problem. And they have an incentive to do what they can to avoid the problem. You don't, you, you don't necessarily need government to be the solution to that problem. The, the, if if, if, if uh, Apple Computer, I'm just using that as an example, if Apple Computer uses lots of chips as it does, it doesn't want to be host held hostage to one lone uh, supplier. So it has an incentive to distribute its, its uh, uh, purchases across many different chip suppliers, even at the expense of paying higher prices for them. It has an incentive to engage in contracting practices that, that prevent, um, uh, uh, that would help to prevent companies that might be subject to being undercut uh, in the short run by low prices uh, from, from actually being undercut. And we, can, we can look at actual business practices and, and, and find this in many cases. There's a, there's a naive belief that, that uh, uh, businesses, that, 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 that businesses they, o they only look at, at, at price. They only look at, the, so they want to get everything at the lowest possible price. And they're complete, unlike the wise and economically informed people in the government, the businesses who have you know, their shareholders' wealth at stake, right, they're, they're not paying attention to these dangers. Only the government's paying attention to the dangers. I think it's very naive. The, the, no one has a greater incentive to pay attention to the, that danger than do the people who use those supplies. They might not get it right all the time, but there's no reason to think the government's going to get it right. In fact, I think if I'm betting my, if I'm betting my money on which of the two parties is going to get it right, the, the, the people with skin in the game or the government, with no, the government officials with no skin in the game, they're just they're, they're, they're po posing for the cameras. They're subject to special interest group pressures. Um, my money is on the people with skin in the game, the, the business people who use those, those supplies. You can't, you, 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 you let, 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 let me end on this. And this is a, an insight I think that's true for all policy discussions, not just trade policy discussions. Um, 
uh, it, it is, and, and you should do this, right? This is what, this is what intellectually engaged people do. So you think about possibilities. Think, well, what if? What about that? What about that? And that's important to do to, to help us better understand the world and maybe to see, uh, uh, to identify dangers that might otherwise uh, be ignored. But you can't get carried away with, with the what ifs. Almost everything in the, almost everything in reality that's possible to happen will never, ever, ever happen. The vast majority of possible things won't happen. It's possible that we'll all get killed in 10 minutes because an elephant will fall through this roof. A flying circus overhead explodes, elephant falls, we're all dead. It's possible, right? You know, you're not gonna run out of the room and think, well, I'm glad I was warned. Just in case, I better take a step, I better go wait outside. Uh, uh, the, the, the criteria should be plot. What, what's, what, narrow things down, narrow the possible down to the to the, to the possible, and then narrow the possible down to the plausible. What's plausible? We're making policy. We're not, we, we, we cannot construct heaven on earth. We cannot construct a world in which we are guaranteed not to suffer uh, 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 unwanted losses. We just can't do it. And so we, gotta make, we, we, have to, we have to act as wisely as we can. To act as wisely as we can, as we can means not wasting our time protecting against every conceivable bad possibility or pursuing every conceivable good possibility. Instead, we should focus our attention when we're making policy on protecting against plausible dangers and pursuing plausible good outcomes. That's the best we can do. So thank you all.